Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfielan. When I'm not taking years to finish short horror books aimed at teenagers, I'm here at the Wolfie Lair reviewing novels. Back in 2020, I got my hands on a rarity for Michael Myers fans. The first Halloween young adult novel, Halloween the Scream Factory. Not to be easily confused with Scream Factory's Blu-ray releases of the Halloween movies. <laughs> Yes, back in 1997, less than a year before Halloween H2O saw release, there was a trilogy of Halloween books starring The Shape aimed at a teenage audience, cashing in on the success of writers like R.L. Stein and his Fear Street books. For whatever reason, there was a big push in the mid to late 90s to try to retool these slasher icons of yesteryear into book stars aimed at a youth audience. It made some degree of sense. Horror was popular in the young adult book market at the time, and the 90s didn't see a lot of play from horror icons like the 80s did. A lot of slasher sequels entered development hell, but the Scream movies were making slasher flicks popular again. Push the laws and you end up dead. Okay, I'll see you in the kitchen with a knife. So there was probably a feeling from the licensors that we need to get horror icons like Michael out there in some form, and after all, in the realm of media, books are a low-cost investment. They're generally written by one person, and they're just a fancy cover wrapped around some words. Not much to lose, especially if you're cashing in on an established name like Halloween. And hey, if there were Halloween books before in the form of novelizations, up to the fourth movie at least, maybe Michael Myers could find some success in the literary space with some original stories, even stories aimed exclusively towards teenagers. That's where the Halloween Young Adult Trilogy came into play. All three books, The Scream Factory, The Old Myers Place, and The Madhouse were written by authorist Kelly O'Rourke, aka Kelly Reno, between October 1997 and February 1998. Not much is known about O'Rourke and whatever happened to her, besides writing another book in 2006 called Misadventures and Merfolk. But apparently Kelly O'Rourke knew Joseph Wolf, a producer of Halloween 2 and 3, and through Penguin Publishing, Wolf contacted Kelly O'Rourke to write these Halloween books, maybe to try to get Michael Myers out there in some form in advance of his re-emergence in Halloween H2O. <laughs> As a Halloween fan, these Halloween books have fascinated me as an obscure curiosity, but their print run seems to have been extremely limited. So copies today of any of O'Rourke's Halloween books are hard to come by, and when you can find a copy on eBay, they have an extremely high asking price as rare collectibles. Because of this, I was hesitant to cover these Halloween books until a fan named Brian Chapman graciously lended me a copy of the first book, The Scream Factory, which I reviewed and made an audiobook out of back in 2020. Not long after that, another fan by the name of Jeff B. Ford lended me his copy of Halloween The Old Myers Place, the second book in the series, and I'd been meaning to get to it for a very long while, but things always got in the way. We were starting to get more new Halloween movies that distracted me, and I feel bad for dragging my feet on continuing these videos on the books, but there don't seem to be any new Halloween movies for the foreseeable future, so with David Gordon Green's Halloween trilogy done, I might as well cover the next part in Kelly O'Rourke's Halloween trilogy with a review of the second Halloween young adult novel. Now, before you watch this vid, I recommend watching my review of the first book, Halloween the Scream Factory from 2020. I also recorded a complete audiobook of the Scream Factory back in 2020 that you can listen to for the full story. Links to both of these videos are in the description, or you can click this card for the review. But all the books in this series are standalone stories that just reference each other. So with this video, you don't really have to worry too much about following a pre-established storyline. There is no overarching storyline. I've also recorded a full audiobook of this second book, The Old Myers Place, and it's available in early access on my Patreon. Patreon Patreon.com slash Dr. Wolfula. Link in the description if you want to listen to my reading of this book early, but it'll be made available here on YouTube for free soon. One last thing before I get to the review of Halloween The Old Myers Place. Since I'm reviewing a book instead of a movie, I didn't have any visual material to work with for a video like usual, and I like to make sure my videos have actual visuals and it isn't just me talking. So like my previous review in this series, I'll be crudely illustrating the plot of this novel with drawings I made using limited animation. Think of this as like one of those book report dioramas you had to do back in junior high, but made by an adult for his audience on YouTube for some reason. On to my review of Halloween The Old Maya's Place. Oh, and thank you to Jeff B. Ford for making this possible. I'll be returning your book soon. The Myers House. The Myers House? You're not supposed to go up there. Yes, I am. 
The second entry in Kelly O'Rourke's Halloween trilogy centers around, surprise, a teenage girl. This teenage girl is named Mary White, no relation to the psychic chick. Mary is a bit of a departure from Halloween protagonists in that she has a bit of a history. Mary's a Los Angeles Valley girl who frequented nightclubs, a real party girl. And Mary had a boyfriend who was a drug addict and he unwittingly sold speed to a cop. And Mary ended up in jail alongside her boyfriend that night. Sounds like some real afternoon special type shit, something out of Seventh Heaven. But hey, it's refreshing for a Halloween protagonist to have a juicy backstory before encountering Michael Myers. They're usually always goody two-shoes until the shape enters their life. Then their life starts to fall apart. I've tried everything. Twelve steps, self-help, group therapy, shrinks. Conversely, Mary's life has already fallen apart and she's trying to put it back together again. And what better way to start over than in a new town? Mary's parents are commissioned to develop a new shopping mall in Haddonfield, Illinois. And Mary's family moves into the small town from bustling Los Angeles. Nobody knows who Mary is in Haddonfield, so she reinvents herself to conform to Haddonfield's more conservative culture, abandoning her wild party girl persona for good. Mary ends up being popular with her peers in Haddonfield too, because she's from the big city and is ahead of the curve on fashion and music. It's said that Haddonfield is trapped in a time warp because of its current lack of a mall. I mean, all the teens hang out at a diner like it's happy days. Mary is faced with a constant reminder of who she once was, though. Mary has a goth cousin who lives in Haddonfield named, uh, Julifer. Her real name is Julie, but she goes by Julifer because I guess it sounds like a cool goth name. But Julifer has a goth friend, too, whose name is just Michelle, so I don't know. Good morning, Michelle, my belle. What? Anyway, Mary and her cousin Julifer used to be close, but ever since Mary reinvented herself and ditched the alternative scene, the two cousins drifted apart and Mary can't be seen with Julifer out of fear of being ostracized by her popular new friends. Tragic. Another thing about Mary makes her the talk of the school, though, that she instantly resents. Her family moved in the old Myers place, the house Michael Myers lived in, and committed his first murder in at the age of six, stabbing his older sister Judith on the Halloween of 63. Michael? To make matters even worse, Mary's bedroom was Judith's. All of this is new to Mary. She didn't grow up with this boogeyman story and doesn't think much of it and wishes people would stop bringing it up to her. Mary moving into the Myers house and being an outsider from Haddonfield does make her a good entry point of the Halloween universe, but her family living in the Myers house is kind of dumb though because this book takes place one year after the first book, The Scream Factory, where Michael Myers canonically kills a ton of people including the mayor. Michael even burns down Haddonfield City Hall and the shape is never after apprehended at the end of that book, so everybody knows Michael's still on the loose and usually he only resurfaces on a Halloween. Mary's parents must be some seriously dumb motherfuckers to want to move into Michael Myers' house, or they're cheap. It's very appropriate that Mary's last name is White because moving into a serial killer's house just one year after his latest killing spree is a real white person move. When Big John and Little John moved in the Myers house, there was at least decades between Michael's last killing spree, and in Curse of Michael Myers, the other real estate agent named John kept his home being the Myers place a secret from his family, too. Further addressing the continuity of this book in regards to the greater Halloween series, the old Myers place makes references to its predecessor, the Scream Factory's events, but the fates of the surviving characters from the previous book are not revealed. The previously surviving characters don't appear at all, so they probably moved away, went to college, or Michael quietly killed them off later. These books themselves have an ambiguous placement in the Halloween series timeline, but according to Kelly O'Rourke herself in an interview, only the first movie is canon to her books, but in the old Myers place, it said that Michael killed 12 people in 1978, which doesn't match up with any figures even if you take Halloween 2 into account which can probably just be attributed to a lack of research by the author, but it can be argued that if these books only follow the plot of the first movie, Michael might have killed some more people on the Halloween night of 1978 after terrorizing Laurie Strode. A Halloween 2 or Halloween Kills alternate aftermath scenario we just don't know about. And if you didn't know already, the Halloween series has multiple timelines, at least four separate movie timelines, five if you count Halloween 3 by itself, 
but these Kelly O'Rourke novels are actually the first follow-ups to the original Halloween to create its own unique timeline involving Michael Myers, beating Halloween H2O to the punch by nearly a year when it abandoned the Thorn plotline to bring back Laurie Strode for the first time. And hey, the Kelly O'Rourke novels are also the first follow-ups to Halloween 2 to disregard its events, and consequently, Michael Myers hunting down family members, something Halloween 2018 would also later abandon as well. These Kelly O'Rourke novels were pioneers in starting things that Halloween fans constantly complain about. Wasn't it her brother who, like, cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. Speaking of stuff to complain about, well, Mary might live in the Myers place now, but she's got bigger problems on her plate. Boy problems! Yeah, the first few chapters chiefly concern Mary's romantic life and her precarious social standing as the new popular girl at Haddonfield High. It admittedly gets heavy on the Deborah Hill aspects of Halloween and lacking on the John Carpenter side of things. Totally. Mary and her friends Shannon, Kimmy, and Tanya chat lots of boy talk, lots of gossip, lots of drama. It can be a bit much being an adult male reading this, but these 90s YA horror books were typically written with teenage girls in mind. Which is kind of weird though, since the villain involved in this particular YA novel is a guy who slaughters teenage girls. So I can kind of see why these books might not have caught on. A school library is going to be kind of iffy stalking a book with a masked killer on the fucking cover. Anyway, back to Mary's relationship woes. Well, she's at the center of a love triangle with two boys at opposite ends of the social spectrum. Her previous ex-boyfriend after the guy who sold speed to the cop, Jeff Wayland, who she met in Haddonfield and dated over the summer, and Josh Pinder, Mary's new boyfriend, the most popular boy in school. Mary met her ex Jeff when he was working with his dad to restore the old Myers place. Mary and Jeff hit it off, but Jeff is the jealous type and caught Mary talking to Josh at a store, and they break up when Jeff gets insulted at Mary, suggesting that they go shopping at a thrift store because Jeff thinks the suggestion is because he's poor and can only afford shopping for clothes at a thrift store. That is true, but Jeff still takes it personally anyway and breaks up with Mary. Once school starts, Mary makes a big rebound near Halloween by dating Josh Pinder, the most popular and rich boy at Haddonfield High, the perfect hunk. Josh even owns a houseboat he takes Mary out on. He's got it all. But Josh might be too good to be true. Mary's friends allude to Josh having some vague form of misconduct with a previous girl he dated. Mary's ex Jeff seems to be more intimately aware of Josh's misdeeds, but Mary just assumes Jeff is being jealous again. There's no way Mary could be dating a future Harvey Weinstein. I'm sorry to be talking so much about teen relationship shit, but a lot of the book is about that. Michael Myers does eventually show up in this book though. It's not just the story of some bitch that moves into his house, and Mary living in the Myers house and specifically in Judith Myers' former bedroom is precisely what makes Mary the prime target for the shape when he gears up for a return this Halloween. When Mary returns from her first date with Josh Pinder on his houseboat, refusing to suck Josh's dick of course, the power goes out in the old Myers place and Mary gets attacked by a mystery man in the dark, but she narrowly escapes death. When Mary returns to her house later with the cops, she finds her ex Jeff unconscious in her bedroom. Jeff claims he rescued Mary and got knocked out by the guy who was really attacking her, but Mary and the cops don't buy it and Jeff spends the night behind bars. It's a real Billy Loomis situation. Sheriff. I didn't kill anybody. But Jeff's just a red herring. He's not some proto Corey Cunningham. Michael Myers for sure was the one who attacked Mary. She just doesn't believe it. I mean, Michael Myers returning to his house during the Halloween season, it's kind of a stretch, don't you think? He came home. Michael Myers' depiction in the old Myers place is consistent with its predecessor, the Scream Factory, in that it isn't consistent with the actual Halloween films. The shapes on the covers of these books look like the classic Michael with the rubber Captain Kirk mask, but in the actual book, Michael is described as wearing a plastic child's Halloween mask that exposes his rotten teeth and matted black hair. Michael also wears a black jumpsuit covered in mud with dirty gloves, and Michael's breath is said to be so terrible you can smell it before you can see him. <laughs> Also, this Michael Myers isn't silent, he growls, so Kelly O'Rourke's shape is definitely a prototype for the grimier portrayals of Michael from the later Rob Zombie and David Gordon Green films. Another inconsistency with Michael Myers within these books in a literary sense is that he isn't referred to as the shape. 
If you aren't familiar, John Carpenter only described Michael Myers as the shape in the original Halloween script to evoke the sense of mystery surrounding the character that Carpenter wanted to depict on film. Michael Myers isn't a person you refer to by name. He's a shape lurking in the shadows. And the shape has endured as a nickname for Michael Myers, and in many of the Halloween novels, Michael is referred to as the shape to maintain that same sense of mystique. Characters call him Michael, but the text usually refers to him as the shape. I saw him. The shape. These young adult novels, though, never call Michael the shape, and almost always refer to him within the text specifically by his full name Michael Myers. Not a big deal, but it does take away from the mystery a bit, specifying exactly who he is. The next day, Mary finds out that Jeff got out of jail scot-free. The cops couldn't pin the attack on him, but Mary still doesn't trust Jeff, seeing as how he's basically been stalking her regardless. So Mary decides to blow off some steam and hang out with her boyfriend Josh and their friends Shannon, Kimmy, Tanya, and Rob. And surprisingly, this young adult novel has underage alcohol use without any afternoon special shit tacked on. Josh has what he calls brewskis, and the group needs a secluded spot to pound them together, but Josh's sister is using the family yacht, so Josh pressures Mary into letting their group into the mall under construction that Mary's parents are building, because it won't be open until Thanksgiving and will be totally empty after all. Which will give them a preview 15 years into the future when online shopping causes the collapse of brick and mortar stores. So against her better judgment, Mary escorts the Scooby Gang here to the local soon-to-be-open Future Dead Mall. Sneaking in through a back door, and the mall is supposedly modeled after the Mall of America at a smaller scale with a giant oak tree in the center above a kid's play area where the gang hangs out. But, you know, this is a slasher movie in book form. So of course the teens split up against Mary's further wishes, with Rob and Tanya heading into a secluded area to fuck, with creepy naked mannequins bearing witness. It's here where Michael carries out his first murder in the book. Toppling the mannequins over Tanya as Michael stabs Rob to death and finally finishes off Tanya. The use of mannequins in this scene reminds me of a somewhat similar sequence in Halloween 2018, where Michael is hiding behind mannequins in Lori's house. Anyway, Mary and the others hear some noises and assume it's security. So they get the hell out of the mall, ditching Rob and Tanya, who they don't know are totally dead now. When Mary finds out that Rob and Tanya are still missing the next day and that their parents are looking for them, Mary feels responsible, but Mary can't tell the last known whereabouts of her missing friends or else she might get in trouble. And Mary doesn't want that. And besides, Mary's got bigger problems. It's Halloween, and Mary doesn't know what costume she's gonna wear to Josh's big Halloween party tonight. Oh no! Since according to Mary, she has left her homeland and ventured hundreds of miles to Haddonfield, Mary decides on the fly to go dressed up as a, uh, gypsy for Halloween. Okay, alright, uh, <laughs> well anyway, Mary heads to Josh's party at his mansion in the Haddonfield Estates, which apparently everybody in town is at. Hundreds of people are said to be at this party, and they're rowdy, trashing the whole place. Somehow Josh is getting away with hosting this far from discreet party without his parents knowing about it. Anyway, Mary meets up with their still alive friends, Kimmy and Shannon, at the party, and Mary finally tells them that she thinks her ex-boyfriend Jeff attacked her a few days ago. Since Shannon is shit-faced, she decides to confront Jeff about this at his house near the cemetery, but Mary wants to keep living, so she lets Shannon and Kimmy go off and do whatever stupid bullshit they have planned tonight. In Josh's backyard, Mary catches some drunk jocks attempting to drown her cousin Julifer and Julifer's friend Michelle in the pool. But when Mary tries to defend her family, the jocks end up chasing the three women down the street. It's just boys being boys. It's all in good fun. Anyway, because Mary finally stood up for Julifer, the two cousins finally make amends, and Julifer and Michelle celebrate by slashing the tires of every jock's car at the party. <laughs> Elsewhere, Shannon and Kimmy are in the process of standing up for Mary, so the two girls, on their own, head to a weirdo's house located in front of a cemetery at night on a Halloween. Jeff isn't home to get his balls crushed by the two drunk teenage girls, though, but they see a light coming from inside the dark cemetery, and of course decide to investigate it. Within the cemetery, they find a jack-o'-lantern sitting on top of Judith Myers' tombstone, Michael Myers' sister and first victim. This is Michael's cue to enter the picture as he chases the girls. Shannon tries to pepper spray the shape, but the guy's already had his eyes shot out. Pepper spray isn't gonna do dick. 
So Michael stabs Shannon to death and eventually corners Kimmy at the cemetery's gates and twists his knife into her stomach, getting all up in her guts, spilling out her intestines. Pretty gnarly for a YA novel. Savage as fuck! Jeff later finds the corpses of Kimmy and Shannon in the cemetery arranged around Judith's grave by Michael. So Jeff calls the cops and heads over to Josh's party to try to warn Mary that the guy who used to live in her house is on the loose and pissed. Back at Josh's party, Mary returns looking for him, but instead of finding Josh, she finds Josh dressed as a drunken, horny vampire who tries to coerce Mary into having sex. But Mary doesn't vaunt to suck his pud. So because Mary doesn't put out, Josh sticks his jock goons on Mary to do God knows what to her. So Mary escapes Josh's mansion and Jeff tries to rescue Mary from Josh and the jocks while Julifer and Michelle help Mary hide. Jeff kicks Josh's ass, but the jocks just end up chasing Jeff like Mary. So Jeff hides out with Mary and manages to convince Mary that Michael Myers really is on the loose and just killed Kimmy and Shannon. So to keep Mary safe, Jeff takes her to her home, the Myers house, the last place Michael Myers would ever go. And Jeff leaves Mary alone there so he can meet up with the cops back at the cemetery and show them the corpses of Kimmy and Shannon. But the corpses have disappeared and Jeff realizes he's further incriminated himself and put Mary in the obvious danger. So Jeff Jeff heads back to the Myers house where he put his ex-girlfriend in the sights of a masked killer. Honestly, I'd love to put all of my exes in the sights of a masked killer. Mary hears Michael entering her house downstairs, preparing to reenact Judith's murder, but Mary discovers a hidden passageway through some loose floorboards in her bedroom and descends down into the crawl space beneath the Myers house, where she finds the corpses of Tanya, Rob, Kimmy, and Shannon displayed ornamentally in the basement around a jack-o'-lantern, with Michael approaching. Mary tries to defend herself with a board with a nail in it. Hell, it worked on Kang and Kodos. Oh, he's got a board with a nail in it! And save humanity, will ya? Run, Kodos! But with Michael, it just doesn't stick. Jeff arrives at the last minute, though, and remembers the shoddy plumbing job he did restoring the Myers house, and grabs a loose gas pipe and confronts the boogeyman, laying down some pipe in Michael Myers, impaling the shape. And Jeff didn't even take Michael out to dinner first. This is a Halloween story after all, so of course it has to end with a fire and explosion. So cue the jack-o'-lantern igniting the gas leak under the Myers house, and Mary and Jeff narrowly escape the house blowing up with Michael still inside. The fire department arrives as Jeff tries to comfort the traumatized Mary. Unbeknownst to them, but known to us though, Michael emerges from the fire and survives. He'll maybe even do some kung fu on some firefighters later. <laughs> Now, this book originally had a much bleaker ending where Mary goes insane after her encounter with Michael Myers and is institutionalized, and Jeff has all of Michael's murders pinned on him and is arrested. Kelly O'Rourke's editors told her to tone things down a notch, though, and make the ending a little happier. Halloween the Old Myers Place is a bit of a mixed bag as a Michael Myers story like its predecessor, The Scream Factory, was. It has a lot less Michael in it, a lot less of him stalking characters. His presence is just implied for a while, that he's been sneaking into Mary's room, living under the Myers house the whole time, which is pretty creepy, but an underexplored premise, along with the main character living in Michael's house in general. We don't spend a lot of time in Michael's house, despite the book being named after Michael's house. There's also just too much relationship shit in the book, at least compared to the level of horror in the book. The horror scenes that are in the book are brief, few, and far between. The party scenes at Josh's house are pointless since Michael never goes there, but a lot of the final act is reckoning with Mary's boyfriend being a sex criminal, which is sort of a darker, real-life horror that distracts from Michael, like that one scene in the Rob Zombie remake. At the same time, Old Myers Place is much more of a conventional Halloween story that isn't bogged down by continuity, with Michael killing teens in interesting settings, even if Michael isn't true to his film counterpart. Ultimately, the book isn't worth its asking price online, but if you're a Halloween fan, it'll be worth a listen when I release my audiobook of it soon. Subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss when that goes live. I give Halloween the Old Myers Place a regular John out of Big John and Little John. Thank you one last time to Jeff B. Ford for lending me his copy of the book and waiting patiently for me to make this video of it. The book will be heading back to you soon, Jeff. Also, if you have a copy of Halloween the Madhouse, the final act of this Halloween Young Adult trilogy that you would like to loan me for a future review and audiobook, reach out to me at drwolfielafanmail at gmail.com or send it to my P.O. Box. Dr. Wolfula, P.O. Box 618-305, Orlando, Florida 32861. If you just want to send me fan mail, feel free to send it there too. 
Before I go, I just want to thank this video's sponsor. Me! Pledge to my Patreon today to support the channel, help it continue to grow, and you'll also get access to weekly movie nights every Sunday and archive commentaries if you miss the movie nights live. Just five bucks a month to get a movie night every week. Here's the movie I'll be streaming next Sunday. Pledge to Patreon.com slash DrWolfula if you're interested, and I thank you in advance. Also, my Twitch channel has returned with new movie streams at the Die-In Theater, and also some game streams. Follow me on Twitch today at twitch.tv slash DrWolfula. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.